Hello and welcome to Talk to Stu with me, Stuart Magoo, and it should be uh, Becky because this is the Becky and Stu show. But unfortunately, Sorry. Becky can't be with us tonight uh, as she is uh, not feeling too too well. Uh, so Phil is uh, sitting in for Becky this evening. So hello, everybody, <laughs> and uh, we've got quite a good uh, podcast show for you this time. Uh, this is a, a sort of subject that's quite important to me uh, for people that may or may not know. I've worked on and off for uh, an organisation known as Site Concern in Worcestershire uh, for about five or six years now. Mm -hmm. And yeah, uh, I've got to know obviously the, the, the organisation quite well uh, and some of the people that work here. So we've invited a couple of people along to from site concern to chat to us this evening so would you like to introduce them i'll change the camera no problem okay so um obviously uh site loss is uh very different for everybody who gets it and it can be for some people quite a debilitating condition uh but for everybody who gets it it's a, a massive change of lifestyle so we thought this would be a good area to to look at for our viewers and listeners um so we'd like to introduce uh tony fisher and samantha hater also known as millie and uh they've both got different types of sight loss so they're going to talk a bit about that this evening so let's uh pass over and say hello to them tony and millie welcome to the Becky and Stu show. Thank you very much indeed, you. Becky. Very fetching you. you look as well, Becky. Thank you very <laughs> much. <laughs> nice to see you. I didn't even know you were called Samantha, you know. No, it's a... It's a... Yeah. Yeah. Well, it's it's going to be out to the world now. Yeah, it is, <laughs> yeah. Oh, did you not want people to know? Sorry. It's all right. No, it's all right. No, it's okay. Mi5 have found out. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Calm down. It's not a helicopter, I can hear. Yeah. <laughs> that, that's my spy career, guy. Yeah, if anybody comes bursting yeah. through the window now, we'll know yeah. exactly why. Yeah. 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 <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. Um, so, yeah, so we just want to start off just by getting to know you both a little bit. So, um, yeah, really, if we start with you, can you tell us a bit about your sight loss condition and sort of how that came up for you in the first place? Uh, yeah. yeah. Um, so my sight loss condition um, was from birth. Right. Um, so I was born with... Um, an undeveloped eye to the right side so i um have a prosthetic eye okay um and my left eye is also undeveloped um and it's uh rugby ball shaped but i also have um coloboma um nystagmus and that's what makes the eye wobble right um photosensitivity so um i was sensitive to bright light um and glare uh and uh when i was 19 i had a detached retina which um wow. made life uh a bit harder i then became night blind right. um so i couldn't see in the dark very well um i had um cataracts Okay. As well. So I had to have surgery for that. Um, and um, my sight started to deteriorate in my earlier 30s. Right. Um, and I had various operations. Um, and I completely lost my sight two years ago. Right. So, yeah, I've been living with com uh, complete sight loss uh two years ago wow uh, from two yeah so that's uh yeah that sounds like quite a an emotional roller coaster yeah it was definitely mm. yeah yeah all, all through life um that with having um crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis as well makes makes life right. difficult when that um is you know has has flared up so, yeah 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 so so quite a lot going on there really to cope with yeah yeah definitely. okay yeah okay well, it sounds like an awful combination yeah um and my heart goes out to you definitely um it's not diff it's not it's certainly not easy dealing with disability um and to have something and then 
lose it completely i can imagine would be really like the the turning of the knife for you yeah yeah but i've always been uh positive about it um mm. and funny enough uh since i've lost completely lost my sight mm. um i've kind of grown in confidence okay. um as well uh i yeah become more confident um just more myself i suppose um if that makes any sort of sense um mm. yeah uh okay good good and um just to get a quick overview of tony as well what's going on for you i think you've got nystigmus as well is that yeah right? nice i got a yeah, nice segment when i said was twins you and me mail i didn't realize that and as, as millie said that's um where we get um the eyes wobble wobbly eyes um and actually i'm saying this with some authority only because when i got the job here i thought i'd better find out what it is i have mm. otherwise i might not get the job so if i don't know what i've got how can i help anybody else so i got all the technical terms right because i've had it again like maybe from birth i was um i've got damaged wires behind my eyes so mm. i've got nystagmus but i've also got a thing called optic atrophy yeah. which means that i don't see anything to the sides or around so in effect it used to be called tunnel vision right. so if you imagine yeah. you look through a pair of binoculars the other yeah. way around yeah. that's right. basically what's happening there and that also means i've got very limited distance vision um which sort of which kind of goes with the nystagmus really they're like little little sight loss bedfellows um and it's weird with me because even though I was born with it, I wasn't really diagnosed with it till I was seven. And that was because I was nearly knocked down by a bus. Mm. Uh, because this, I'm, I'm getting old now and I'm going back to, this is in the 1970s, um, the early 70s. And um, I was going to mainstream primary school and having real difficulties. I didn't like crowds. I didn't like, uh, basically, because I couldn't see right. very well. And when I nearly got knocked down, my parents then thought, oh, we better get him checked out here because something's not quite right. And I went to the doctors and I always remember it was this Irish doctor and he stank a whiskey <laughs> and um, he dragged me into this sort of this. It's not too sinister, don't worry, but he dragged me into this really dark cupboard <laughs> and he shone some lights in my eyes. And this is this is early days, I know, but these little frames in glasses. Do you remember that? Or yeah, changing yes, the yeah. frames and all and uh, and he turned around to uh, to my mum and dad and said, "Well, the lad's got partially sighted. The lad's partially sighted. He was uh, from Scotland, and um, <laughs> he said the the best thing is we'll try we we'll try get him into a specialist school. So um, and that's what they were called then. Of course, they were called special mm -hmm. schools. And I was re I consider looking back now, I'm really fortunate in that. Um, yeah, I went to a, a blind and partially sighted school from the age of seven right up to leaving school." so that really helped me but that's where my journey started really was that right. nearly being knocked down by a bus okay uh, so i wouldn't recommend it for anybody who wants to get diagnosed you know keep no. away from buses <laughs> yeah did yeah. you feel you've got limited sight don't i remember that you had busted a bus once yes 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 yeah, might yeah. have been the same bus it was moving, it was moving. <laughs> oh really it was, wow. it was now that is a story <laughs> i mean um you know it, it was very painful but the bus recovered yeah, oh, that's good to know. <laughs> so, uh, Millie just came up with an interesting fact about nystigmus or nystagmus. How do you pronounce it? That's the first thing. Nystagmus. You say nystagmus, I say nystagmus. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, go on, tell us. Um, so the fact that I have come up with is that uh, nystagmus can happen at any age. Um, you can acquire a, a, a nystagmus, get it? right at any age and um yeah it can be very disorientating for people because it for people it feels like being seasick right so right. yeah it's but it's very it can be very disorientating very sicky for people not nice at all if you acquire it at, at an older age yeah mm -hmm. i can imagine it'd be like neo coming out of the matrix or like whoa <laughs> yeah. what's this right <laughs> not to be <laughs> Not to be belligerent about it. Just... Yeah, 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 yeah. Actually, well, they're, yeah, they're looking for a plot for the next one, aren't they? So yeah. there you are. It can't be any worse than the last one, right? Right, right. <laughs> I suppose. Uh, so, okay. So let's go back to Millie. So tell us about you. So you told us about your eye condition and how that's affected you. But how have you 
lived your life? What have you done? You know, uh, what school, been your college, challenges. Um, yeah, that sort of thing. Yeah, so with school, I went to a mainstream school. It took uh, my mum a while to find the right school for me, but I went to a really good school, Great Morgan Primary School. Mr. Cam, he was amazing. Am I allowed to mention names? Yeah, um, yeah. yeah. I think it'd be cool. um, and it was awesome. I even had my own TV at the front of assemblies when everybody else was watching films. I had my own TV. Oh, okay. um, I also had a support assistant as well, mm. Sue Plummer. She was lovely. I got to secondary school. I got to uh, year was it eight, I think it was. And then uh, that's when the Crohn's disease. And obviously Cl Clytus started to uh -huh. to come in and play up. Right. So I was ill a lot. Um, I got to the point where I uh, was under six stone wow. um, in hospital on IV, steroid drip. Um, so missed my schooling, my GCSEs. Mm. So I went to college a few times, studied mechanics. Couldn't complete it because the Crohn's was playing up then. Uh, then I had the detached retina at the yeah. age of 19. Uh, after that, I went to Worcester College, right. did, did some of my GCSEs and A-levels, okay. and went on to the Royal National College for the Blind. Right. And then I studied sound engineering. Okay. I... I had a bit of a traumatic experience the last year of college um, where I got attacked by a couple of lads. Wrong place, yeah. wrong time kind of thing. Really mm. not my confidence. Mm. I put on a lot of weight right. um, because I was too scared to go out. Mm. Yeah. So I, I was too scared to go out. I was, like, unless I was with somebody, I, I wouldn't go out um and then that sort of got got to the point where i was that unfit mm. uh five minute walk at the shop was just absolutely exhausting for me okay. and got to the point where it was enough was enough i need some help here okay. so i had cbt um therapy cognitive behavioral therapy yeah. which really helped and the therapist asked me, what do you enjoy doing? What did you like doing before all of this happened? And there's martial arts. Oh, yeah. Um, and she said to me, well, go and find uh, a martial arts uh, team to go, in, to go and join. So I did. So I started studying classical Japanese jiu-jitsu. Oh, nice. Um, and from there, I really enjoyed helping to sort of teach the newer students. Mm um and then went on went back to the rnc and studied gym instructing and personal training really enjoyed it uh i set up my own per, uh, personal training business for a while i worked in a, a few different gyms uh, which i absolutely loved and i then sort of started struggling again with my site this time where right. it started to go downhill yeah um so as it was going downhill i went back to study again for sports massage therapy because i thought well if i lose my sight at least i can still do that because massage therapy is all about touch yeah it's better not to see really not to yeah. look at what you're doing it's better to feel what you're doing use the other senses yeah yeah uh and did that set up my own business again but then after that we had covid so just as i set my business up covid kicked in so i had to stop all of that so that was a bit that's of a that's just like the worst yeah that was yeah. That, that was a real bummer that was yeah. mm. um and, and through covid uh, and i had a lot of operations um it brought my site back and it brought my site back really well actually um okay. but so for the course of a month it just completely went oh. they tried to save my site with more operations but it couldn't be saved so mm. um but th throughout my life as well I, i've uh been with worcester warriors right. with their mixed ability team and, and blind rugby and i've gone to spain uh to play for the mixed ability team 
and to showcase uh, blind rugby. Uh, been to Scotland with them to play for the Calcutta Cup in a mixed mixed ability tournament. I've I went and did the three peaks with them so we could raise wow. money for okay. charity. Yeah, uh, we right. raised money for guide dogs for the blind. And yeah, I I've done many different things over the years to be honest. I've mm. I've done a lot of fundraising for charity as well. Um and I currently now I'm, I'm trying to work on a gym buddy database. Right. Okay. Uh, and this is to provide people with volunteers mm. to go to gyms uh, for people who are blind and visually impaired. Right. Because, unfortunately, uh, out of all the disabilities, mm. blind and visually impaired people are, are the least fit and active. Right. Um. And I know this myself because since losing my sight, I've really been struggling right. to yeah. to go to a gym. I, I can't just walk up into a gym now and go there and be like, oh, yeah, let's just go around equipment like I used to be able to. Of course, yeah. Uh, it's made it a lot harder. Part of that for me is com is confidence on, on that bit, going mm. and doing that. But it's just so much harder because paying, paying for a personal trainer to help guide you is a mm. lot of money each time. Yeah. So this is something that I've, that I've been working on for a couple of years, trying, been, been trying to set up. Mm um to to help other people get into the gym but it wouldn't you know eventually i'd like it to be for other disabilities and uh for people who may have mental health conditions as well that may okay. not feel confident or comfortable to go to to a gym and may find having a gym buddy mm. would be better for them plus mm. it also gives you that kind of competitive factor once you get to right. know once you get to know that buddy and there's nothing better than being competitive when you're in yes. a, when you're in the gym or doing some sort of physical activity exactly. it's, it's, it's just you know great and you just test each other and Push see each what yeah, forward, put, yeah. Yeah, yeah 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 exactly yeah, help fantastic. each other reach reach goals yeah. yeah well i mean that's sort of quite mind-blowing really that mm -hmm. that whole potted history it's sort of like you're, you're uh, you've gone through a lot you know i see that you're quite a resilient person i think coming through all of that uh and you know i mean it's hard to know which particular thing to kind of say oh yeah let's let's drill into that and talk about that for a bit because <laughs> yeah, there's so yeah. much there yeah. um i think it's yeah it's just amazing everything that you've achieved you know yeah. through i i could no more run at one peak let alone three yeah. you know so <laughs> yeah. that in itself is one big thing it, it was and, it was hard work and we did it with the with the with the blind rugby team as well so we were all visually impaired right, with right. sighted guides so mm. you know it wasn't just me and when i did that i did have some sight left you know right. uh, but there were people there who were totally blind who were doing it right. um and they were just going up there like a like a whippet yeah, yeah. <laughs> it was just and it, even for me it was awe inspiring you know mm. yeah. so watching them do it it's just amazing what people can achieve when they put their mind to it yeah yeah, yeah. That's exactly um and i think the thing is the biggest barrier that people can have is themselves sometimes mm. yeah yeah whereas that old thing fear fear can be the mind killer exactly exactly um i mean you, you get to an almost agoraphobic state um if you allow yeah. yourself to and you don't sort of resist the the urge to fear everything outside your front door yeah mm. yeah and I think it's interesting that you mentioned cognitive behaviour therapy, CBT. Mm. That does, you know, particularly for people that are needing to kind of get over that, um, you know, fear of going out. I was agoraphobic for a while. I mm. didn't leave the house for about 12 months. Mm. Uh, and that was that was a long time ago now. Yeah. Um, but, you know, I, I kind of moved forward with that um, by doing the CBT stuff when I was in therapy and it's just little things every day but you know equally if if somebody is in that position where they can't get out and they can't do things that's fine mm. too yeah we're not judging um no, no not, at all. But, not at all but you know that doesn't mean you shouldn't you know 
maybe push yourself a little bit here or there whatever those steps are just taking baby steps and and seeing what you can achieve and you might surprise yourself mm -hmm. i think um you know and certainly everything that you you've said there is really quite surprising and i think it's also finding the right kind of community of people mm -hmm. yeah to be in as well finding the right people that are going to push you yes to be to be better within yourself but also um be understanding mm. and uh i can't think of the word now sorry guys um it's okay no problem yeah to, to be understanding and you know have empathy um, yeah, yeah. to, to mm. understand and the understand you know yeah to understand what you you may be going through and yes. things yeah. like that like um a lot of people with vision impairments you know they 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 go to jogging clubs running clubs yeah. you know mm. like uh worcester black pair joggers or more than mm. joggers um and they really find that that helps running because they'll build themselves up slowly but they're also getting into a group of people that like-minded yes yeah. yeah um and it's finding that right place for you whether, whether that's you know, is martial arts, whether it's something like judo, which which I've started getting back to now. Mm. Um, and I'm actually loving it being at judo. Um, or whether it's a uh, goal ball or, or blind, you know, blind football, VI football. Mm. It's, yeah. or, you know, even if it's a book club or something like that, mm. you know, it's, it's yeah. finding those people who are like-minded yeah. and. Had maybe similar experiences. Yeah. With. Yeah. I mean, it, it, it's not even necessarily based on the treatment um, routine or anything like that. That sort of links you. It's it's just, you know, everybody has the same reaction to certain situations. And so family members and stuff like that will react to your, yeah. your pain, your difficulties, your limitations and stuff like that. Probably in similar or maybe even the same way yeah. so you can you can converse on that level like oh you, yeah. you find that maybe people are a little bit too helpful at times yeah. and you just want to have a bit of independence yeah definitely, yeah. definitely. how do you communicate that yeah. you know maybe i can get some tips and hints from you on how to better communicate with my yeah. support team i mean peer know. support yeah. is always the the best thing but if mm. you've got like a shared interest at the same time that makes yes. it because sometimes you can have like a peer support group set up and everybody goes along and you're all sort of sitting around and then there's somebody kind of geeing everybody along and mm. and that poor per that person who runs the group has to uh you know try and find a different speaker every week and mm. hope that it's interesting to people and all of that yeah. whereas yeah. if you if you're meeting together to do something that you're all you know even if you don't like and 100% enjoy it but if you just enjoy it a bit mm. then at least you've got something to talk about yeah it's something we yeah. bring up a little bit later on about uh, part of what I do these days is mm. um, running groups and talking about that peer-to-peer -peer support it's quite interesting to know and it's what you say there Mel about the common interest is not necessarily that oh look at me I'm I've, I've also got a visual impairment yeah, actually, mm. actually look at me I quite enjoy running yeah mm -hmm. look at me yeah. I quite enjoy that and it's quite funny because in in the groups that I run when I'm looking at who the, the room dynamic if you like a lot of the time I'm pairing people up or sitting people next to each other who I know have a common it could be reading mm. it could be you're going for good walks it could be it could be you know re just sometimes just watching a tv show they've got so they've got a, they've got a favorite or they're from that same generation they enjoy nostalgia yeah and all of a sudden when the group first starts and it can be a bit sterile and it's all about you know a little bit you know woe is me kind of thing mm. yeah. and then all of a sudden we can spend half an hour not even talking about it and yeah. i know that's how the group is working yeah because absolutely. we're getting away from from that because it's not all about that it's mm. about living your life isn't it yeah. and yeah. um and that's what i suppose for you mill that's where sport's a big deal isn't it yeah because that is your life that's what you enjoy mm. yeah, um, is, yeah so meeting other people interested in sport that's fine they don't necessarily have to have a visual impairment they can just no. be into sport yeah and exactly yeah, yeah. It's, it's finding that common ground with people mm. it's also showing people and educating people that yes i am blind and yes i can still do this as well um and educating them in, in that kind of way that you know uh, i may need a little bit of support but mm. i can still do what exactly you know we still retain some independence yeah. yeah yeah within that sport yeah yeah 
Yeah. Yeah, it's quite mad. So, Tony, tell us about your background, your life. What have you done? Because you've been you've been around a bit. Yeah, I've been around the block a little while now. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I um, as I mentioned earlier, I went to um, a blind and partially sighted school in Bradford in West Yorkshire. And like many of my friends at school, we were really into all things audio for obvious reasons. And um, and I remember I didn't go out a lot with my mates. I wasn't like, to go to get out in the fields with my friends because obviously couldn't see very well so therefore my, my friendship group we usually get guys from school that come over stay at hours for the night and stay at theirs that kind of thing but the one thing i really loved was radio always loved radio growing up and it was you know i'm going back now to again i sound really old now but this is the late 70s early 80s so there was no internet or anything like that so everything was about the radio and um I, I used to do pretend radio programs when I was about, I started when I was about eight or nine, mm. uh, recording them onto cassettes. And this um, competition, <laughs> comp did you used to do that as well? Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. The, the, what, the Stu and Phil show, was it? <laughs> yeah, pretty yeah. much. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, and here you are again. Like, it's nothing to do with the technology's <laughs> changed, hasn't it? Yeah. yeah. But, um, yeah, I think came up in the Sun newspaper, and it was just looking for new young DJs at that oh. time. And uh, Tony Blackburn, actually, sensational, was it? Uh, was one of the judges. And so I sent this cassette off, and um, and I came runner-up. And I was only 12, and the winner was 19. So this was seen as quite a big deal in the local mm. papers. You know, the yeah. Spember of Bugle or whatever yeah. it was, got very yeah. excited. <laughs> and um, I got offered a job on hospital radio when I was 13. Oh, lovely. Um, so I was off and running, really. And then I thought, well, okay, let's make a bit of money and start my own mobile disco mm. at that time. And my dad used to drive me around. We used to lug all these records about and stuff. And I used to play all the youth clubs and, yeah. and if I could get away with it, pubs, different time. <laughs> you, you know, you could play a pub when you were 14 or 15 or whatever. But the money, you know, was, was very good for, my, for that age. And it was quite obvious that that is what I wanted to do. And I used to... Um, I had a local radio station that I used to love called Pennine Radio, which was the commercial station for Bradford. And um, I used, I'd knocked on their door one day and said, I was in teas and coffee. I want to make a tea and coffee. I can, and I know a lot about PRS. Now, PRS um, is the Performing Rights Society. And it's the paperwork that you used to have to do. You still have to do it, but it's a lot easier to do than it used to be. And what happened was every time anybody played a record on the radio, you'd have to write down the title, the artist, the publisher, uh, the composer, the record label, the prefix, the suffix, and the time it was on with the stopwatch. Wow. Now, no DJ wants to have to sit there with all that paperwork. So I used to, in the summer holidays, used to go and sit in the studio and do their PRS for them, mm -hmm. which gave me an, an idea opportunity to watch them at work. Mm -hmm. And the next thing was... Um, when I left school, I was offered a YTS at that very radio station. It was the youth training scheme at that time. So at 16, I was at Pennine Radio on a YTS. And then somebody left and I got my own show. So by the time I was 17, I was on air doing um, an evening show, eight till midnight, five nights a week, um, which got quite a following because I was very young. Mm. And of course, all the listeners were the same age as me or younger. So they were so i had some credibility yeah. so it was top 40 radio it was brilliant it was a really good way to sort of learn my chops and all that um and i did that for about a year and then i got a call from the bbc um and a friend of mine was working at the time i said you know that the tea time show on your way because the bbc used to have all these local radio shows that all had titles mm -hmm. on your way afternoon digest mm -hmm, yeah. midday spin whatever and blow me, I got the job. So at 18, uh, nearly 19, I was at Radio Leeds. And then when I was 20, I got the top job. I got breakfast, the breakfast show on Radio Leeds, and I did that for about five years. And from there, I just then started to move from station to station, BBC. Mm -hmm. Then I went back into commercial again. I became manager at a, a commercial station in York called Minster FM. I was there for a few years. I worked at Hart, um, Kiss in Leeds. Um, when it was launching across Yorkshire, a dance music station, even though I knew nothing about dance at the time. Okay. I had to do my homework on that one. Um, <laughs> and then launched a radio station in Newcastle in Teesside Tyneside called Century. Um, then I moved back to, uh, when I moved to Worcester and uh, got a job at Wyvern FM. Did breakfast there with a girl called Katie. We were Tony and Katie, the morning crew. Did that for a few years. Then I moved uh, to Surrey, to BBC Surrey. So I went back to the BBC in the mid 
noughties, about 2005, mm. um, did mid-morning there. Mm -hmm. Then I went back to Worcester because we missed Worcester so much because my wife's from Worcester. And so we got married in Surrey, but we went back to Worcester again. And I went back to BBC Hereford and Worcester and did mid-morning there for about seven years. And then I moved to Essex for BBC Essex and um and then i uh, took redundancy last year and started working at site concern yeah. so there yeah, i spotted history a little bit of a uh, sorry to give the whole cb out but no, no, um no. and the reason i mention all those things is because during all that time i had to bluff quite a lot of what i've done and what i mean by that is that all the things i say to people now when i when i do these groups is you know tell people that if you need assistance if you need don't be ashamed you have nothing mm. to be own it it's yours you know own yeah. it you're gonna if you need help ask for it it's you, you know it's it that you have to have the same rights and experiences as everybody who's fully sighted exactly. and i didn't i didn't work that at all when i was in radio uh hardly ever and because my fear particularly when i was younger was that they would see i was i wouldn't get the job Oh no, because he's yeah. that he's that kid that can't see. We can't give him that job. He won't be able to do that. Yeah. And actually, there's a bit of truth in that. I'm sure. Yeah. yeah. Um. So certainly there was. I'm mean, hopefully things have changed, but I still think it exists. Yeah. There is a certain blind bias there, and if you excuse the pun there, Mel, I do apologise. That's right. <laughs> um. But there is, and it, and it's and it continues. But at that time, I had to adapt. So there were certain things that happened in in my career where. And when I first started at the BBC, for instance, everything was on rip, what you call rip and read. It was, they were like big typewriters, rip and read machines. Right. So when a breaking news story, they'd rip it off the machine, take it okay. down to you and read it out. Now that was on um, paper with a very dodgy ribbon. Mm -hmm. Imagine reading that. And I have to put it so close to the microphone. So I'd be like this. Uh, and I'd have to like move the thing over the top of the microphone and put it really close to my face to read it. And I, I got into a habit of how that's how I did it. I moved the mic to one side and I'd read like that. When and then, so that was that. And then things like um, tape, you know, ta editing tape, you know, really mm. um, quarter inch tape, and you'd have razor blades. And you know, and that was when I'm still alive, to be honest. <laughs> <laughs> Looking back, yeah. blood all over the studio. And and, um, and then of course, then computers came in, and all the screens were really small in the early yeah, days. Of course, so yeah, when yeah. the first, so I get a script, Which, and so oh, you got, a, so I'd have to stand up, I'd have to just remove the mic and stand up and lean into the screen to read the cue, yeah. and I was doing that for years, and mm -hmm. I just used to pretend. Now the beauty of radio, of course, is that nobody can see you, yeah. so they don't know you're doing that. And in the various bits of TV I've done over the years. I've had to learn things like auto cue, so I can't mm. work with auto cue because my nystagmus would mean that my eyes would wobble, oh, and people yeah. would think I was drunk or something, yeah. or you know. Yeah. Yeah. So, and you can't get full eye contact because, like, if I look at that camera there at the moment, and I'm looking at you, mm. I've got my 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 face will automatically go a little bit like that because if mm. I'm reading auto cue, my nystagmus means I have to focus on on words. Yeah. So I would do that, which is not natural. If you're a newscaster, you'd be straight ahead. But of course, mm. I can't. So ultimately, by doing that, so there's little. So if you learn auto cue, then you can learn. You pretty much know what you're going to say. You're all right, and you can have a maybe a magnifier down below or whatever. Right. So there's ways of getting around it, but really, it doesn't doesn't suit television as well as radio because radio you can do anything you want in the studio, and you can yeah. move a mic around, and you can make things bigger around you you know you can rewrite things or whatever mm. so that was kind of my journey really and I've, I've always considered myself very lucky yeah um to have done what i did because i did it for 40 years on the radio and i i loved every minute of it mm. i'm glad i've left when i have mm. uh because it's it's changed now and it's time for me to do something else and i love what i do now it's it's very fulfilling and um but I've got some wonderful memories of it, and it was, it was you know, great fun. It's particularly in the early days, it was exceptionally fun. And, uh, yeah, and uh, again, going back to sight, I think one of the things is that you, I think that because I was born with a sight condition, mm. I think I've always had to cope. So I've never thought of yeah. it as coping rather than mm. this is what it is. Yes, yeah. yeah. And I think the hardest part is when you've had a journey like like Millie's, for instance, where things have happened that you've had to constantly readjust for. Mm. That's hard work. Yes. Um, because you're not, you, I'm just, I'm starting on this, I'm working on the same level all the time. I know where my level is because it doesn't change. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I mean, of course, 
you know, your sight, sight deteriorates as you get older anyway, naturally. Yeah. So, yeah. you know, things are going to get more difficult to read, but that's just natural. Um, whereas um, for me, whenever a th something comes up, then it's, okay, I can heal. I know this because this is what I am. This is my, this is my base. Yeah. This is where I'm at. But we'll probably come on to this. But for me, modern technology, particularly in the last 10, 15 years, mm. has been a godsend if you're doing anything Look at that. That's a professional segue right yeah. there. Isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> he knew where I was going to go next. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, so that is where we wanted to go next, is we wanted to, to start talking about what aids and adaptations and... Uh, things that are useful, particularly, you know, maybe digital technology, if there's anything there. Because so I think for, um, you know, for, for people that are uh, dealing with a physical disability, you know, the standard thing is walking stick, wheelchair, mobility scooter, those kind of things, mm. um, you know, and... Uh, it, Braces, it's... <laughs> et cetera. Sorry? Braces as well. Braces, yeah, there's all sorts of stuff like that. Mm. And it, it's fairly kind of... Uh, orthotics are sort of fairly mechanical as well you, yes, you see yeah, yeah. you see what's wrong with someone you can see what the fix for it is if someone's missing a leg maybe they need a fake leg um and they also get the rehabilitation for all of that as well yeah yes. and so there's those kind of things whereas sight loss is a completely different thing because everybody's sight loss is so varied and so different and there's so many different products out there uh and you know different things so i mean you know simply millie you're using a white cane yep and there's like three four five different types of white cane yeah there's there's quite a few different canes now yeah, yeah more more than that now even um, more than that so yeah yeah because you have uh, canes with wheels on now mm. you still have your your tap tap canes uh you still have your your roller canes mm. um you have canes that uh, uh such as the we walk cane uh that have um kind of echo location okay oh. um oh. and uses sensors to to um sense sorry sense where uh, things are from waist high and above okay so you still got to use it normally as a normal cane um, but it senses anything from from waist height and above. So um, overhanging branches and trees, it'll pick all pick all of that up. But it's oh. also but it also has a sat nav, basically like a sat nav on it kind of thing. Um, right. Navigation. It also uh, it buzzes at you when it's when it's it vibrates. It's got that hectic vibration. Okay. When anything is coming close, uh, so if you're coming close to a wall or anything like that. Okay. Um, yeah and then you have other canes that just work with the hectic vibrations yeah. um using uh like infrared and things like that wow. um but yeah the things that are coming out now are amazing i mean uh, a lot of people with vision impairments mm. um are using apps like be my AI, be my eyes yeah. uh, which has got be my ai on there and mm. um you can use that take a photo and it'll read anything and everything out to you that's that's in the photo so oh, there, really? you know people are learning different ways to to use that i mean you've still got braille as well mm, your old yeah. your old fashioned braille but it's still used not as much now mm. but it is you know it is still being used um yeah you have um <laughs> so you you also have like text to speech on on your phones or or voiceover mm. um so on your iphones and your android phones um it also has like a uh, braille input and output so you can connect a, a braille kind of little braille sort of laptop and, and things like that um, to it right. so you can so uh, on, on like the keyboard it raises up so you can feel the braille right. on, what's yeah. your phone, on, on, on what's on your phone or what's mm -hmm. on your computer um, yeah so there, there, there is so much out there I mean you have JAWS, Supernova you have Microsoft's own um, narrator. You yeah. have uh, Zoom text. I don't, I don't know if it's still Zoom text these days, but mm. um, yeah. So you can mag you have magnification on computers, mobile phones, um, color inversions, all sorts. And so, um, 
the suppliers of the of these varying kinds of equipment relatively easy to find um yeah they are relatively easy to find i mean r and i b um supply a lot of things um sight and sound you know you have your, your organizations and companies of looking through microsoft uh you, you have the inbuilt accessibilities um with that and along with your phones as well with the inbuilt accessibilities um so yeah they're, they're not too hard to find plus you can also contact your um local sight loss organization mm. such as site concern um or you Shameless can point. contact the <laughs> nice. sensory impairment team right and things like that so yeah so uh apologies there because obviously i earlier on millie said to me shall i put my uh phone on uh vibrate and i i was like yeah yeah if you could that would be fine she said well do you want me to switch it off altogether said, no no vibrate's okay it won't cause any bother at all that was a call coming in for some tech, though, wasn't it? You just already plugged it, so and that was the first order. And here's me <laughs> just leaving mine on full bloody volume. As we all start oh. checking our phones again, just in case. <laughs> <laughs> so, apologies, sir. Um, I mean, there's loads of stuff to pick up in there. Mm. Yeah. Um, you know, I mean, you mentioned JAWS. Uh, people, uh, a lot of people might not have come across that, but it's quite a fantastic piece of software. Yeah. But there's... You know, with with all of these things, there's a bit of not all of them, but a lot of them. There's a bit of a learning curve with yeah. with these things. So mm. I think, um, you know, somebody just coming to it new yeah. might be a bit sort of overwhelmed. So I think w- with what you were like, saying, with going to the RNIB, yeah. uh, to your local sight loss charity, getting in yeah. touch with your local authority to see if they've got a sensory impairment team set up. Most do. Uh, you know, so you can get those people to come in and, you know, help you, support you, access those things. I I mean, for me, um, when I completely lost my sight, mm. I had to learn how to use a computer all over again, basically, and my right. phone, you know, my mobile phone, mm. uh, computers, um, all of that technology. Um, mm. And it was a real learning curve. And um, a good friend of mine who is a technology for life um customer service chap um who works for rnib really helped me out um yeah uh him and um his his um girlfriend and okay. they've been you know it's been really good and I've, I've learned so much and i'm actually finding now i've lost my sight i'm loving t- technology so much more <laughs> I, I i used to hate it i honestly used mm. to hate it. i used to be like i don't need that ah, yeah. and fight against it but now i've come to realize well God, life would have been so much easier if I'd have just, you know, gone with it. Yeah. But I mean, some some of those things. So uh, just to go back to Jaws, that kind of like reads everything out to you on the screen. But I've seen people using it where the, 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 the text to speech, what it's saying is so fast. And I'm just like, how can you even understand what that's saying? It's so easy, blah, 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 sort of thing. It's coming over there. You, you can adjust the speed of it, though. Yeah. So you can make it very slow or very quick. Yeah. And uh, years ago, I, I know people get on really, really well with Apple technology, mm. uh, with sight loss. Quite often it's referred to as being one of the better things um, to use. Obviously, it's a bit more expensive than Android things but it does work really well and i remember see uh this chap i used to uh do some work with and again he was he was just using the inbuilt apple things on his iphone and this is going back six or seven years maybe longer um you know and just to sort of see he'd have it you know plugged into his ear on a little um you know thing and so he could be talking to you and doing other things but stuff's going on on his phone and you can see his hand like this going up and down so he'd be talking to you about something and at the same time be Googling it and you wouldn't know that he was doing that because it's all happening in his ear. It's not like, you know, and he'd just, yeah, just come out with a fact or something. Yeah, yeah. But yeah. how did you find that? Well, I just Googled it. Did you? When? Mm-hmm. Sort of thing. Um, yeah. Another app that you mentioned there was the Be My Eyes, which yeah. I think is a really important one to, to put out there for people. Uh, because basically this this is a great thing because it's like a community thing in a way yeah. uh, where people who have um, sight 
uh, sign up as essentially a volunteer to mm. be a be my eyes to be a pair of eyes and then for the person with sight loss they they go on the be my eyes app and they use the camera in their phone to look at whatever it is they need uh information at, about and then the person on the other end will like read it to them or say you know yeah. duck or whatever it is that needs to be looked at at that point um you know so that can help people with simple things like cooking and all sorts and now you're yeah. saying there's an ai version yeah as well. there's an ai version yeah yeah where you can you, you just take a picture um and it will describe everything in the picture um and then you can ask it more questions if you want to yeah. so you can type that in or talk that in and it will you know say um i take a picture of you um and i can ask you know what color top are you wearing Mm -hmm. tell you tell you what color or it'll read you know I, I use it for things like reading mail um or any sort of labels it's really good for um it's good for you know finding out what's around you mm -hmm. yeah there's you know it's, it's very good for all sorts of different things so i mean people are finding so many different ways of using it so does it give you an idea of field of view and depth as well will it explain to you how a rough estimation of how far something is from you so that you can move freely at the same time as using do you know it? what i haven't actually tried that one so i don't know i can't answer that one to be honest with you um okay. yeah i'm not sure on that might be a good one to check how far away is that tree sort of thing yeah yeah yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. Um, there is um there is a new gadget on the, the market now which i think is, is android based at the moment they were showing off at site village uh, which is this amazing oh, event that happens every year yeah. Yeah. in birmingham and we went along and it's where it's effectively what it is it's it's glasses um the, the glasses frame anyway and on your ear there is a, an earpiece and there's two cameras on either side of the glasses and mm. the, what the earpiece is doing is it's picking up what's around you and mm. telling you what's around you as you're walking mm. um it's in its infancy yet but when I had the demo, I must admit, I thought, wow, this is this is quite game changing stuff. Mm. They're, they're, that will go pretty quickly, though, because mm. you've got the AI now um, and things like ChatGBT, they're linking things up with yeah. things like ChatGBT yeah. um, exactly. and all the different AI things for it to be a lot quicker, a lot smoother mm. um, with different pieces of technology. Well, they've got AI discovering new molecules and a new way to build proteins and things like this so it's That's crazy amazing, how it? much yeah. it's uh, yeah. in the I mean, there's a lot of, there's an awful lot of talk at the moment in very anti-ai mm. but there is some good stuff and there's some it's, it's going to it's going to change the world yeah um but it's just how it changes the world mm. that's the big question isn't it but yeah. when it comes to vi absolutely Mel. Mm. i mean yeah. that's going to be one of the things yeah. that it's going to be able to interpret much quicker what's going on rather than any other engine could you know because yeah. i mean you're looking at an, an android phone in your pocket and a, a pair of specs on your head mm. that can only do so much because it's, it's only as good as the camera and the information that's stored within within an internet browser of course. and a map mm. whereas with ai ai can then transfer all that information in pretty much a couple of seconds mm -hmm. and give you even more information mm. about where it is and also and tailor it to your specific needs mm. yeah. because yeah. there are certain things that he will get to know about you Millie, that that you know it would take years for any kind of algorithm to work out yeah and it yeah. might just be something like you know it, it knows what kind of shops you're interested in so yeah. you might be mm. able to suggest yeah. actually you want you want to go across town so mm. if you head left and there's a crossing along the way there's a TK Maxx at the end or whatever. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's little things like that that it can add. And that's exactly. something that was talked about a lot of site village this and, year. And you'll have that main AI and, and chat GPT going over to uh, devices like uh, Amazon Alexa. Yeah. 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 It's, it's yeah. going to be transferring over to. But you've not just got those sorts of technologies. You have, you have other technologies such as um, pieces of kit for equipment, like, mm. like talking mic uh, microwaves. Or yeah. you can um, have like your one cup kettles, which are really good. Mm. or um even to the point where you, you have your um liquid level indicators yeah um and it's it's you can even get uh talking air air fryers now yeah you know yeah. i mean i i remember years ago i think i mentioned uh i yeah uh, i i knew uh 
Elizabeth Bio, who's one of the um, trustees at Site Concern, and you were in a different capacity. Uh, and I remember being at her house the first time and all of these objects in the kitchen that would start talking to you. Yeah. And because this is, we're talking 20, 30 years ago mm. now, um, yeah. 20, you know, uh, they would just randomly start talking sometimes. Yeah. You know, the microwave would just start talking and <laughs> you'd just be like, whoa, <laughs> you know, yeah. especially if you'd come in, you were a bit, a bit you know, two sheets to the wind, been out. <laughs> So I knew her, her kids were all mates and stuff. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, you come in a bit tipsy in the microwave. So I just said, please, add time. And you're like, whoa, what time? <laughs> yeah. You know, yeah. so yeah. that could be shocking. But even just the liquid level indicator, when I first saw that, I was like, oh, that's genius. Yeah. Yeah. And it's a time, yeah. it's, by the, today's standards, it's old school tech. Yeah. But it's still, it does the job. It works, yeah. doesn't I it? I can yeah. remember my CDT class at school. I did one of those, liquid level indicator. How about that? They were all, all, all just put two wires in a cup. <laughs> when they yeah. completed the circuit, it went to... <laughs> that was it. <laughs> yeah. Different times, of course. Yeah. Wouldn't have been part tested, don't <laughs> it? Um, it's an interesting, though, what you say there, Stu, about um, how sometimes it's the smaller things. Mm. One of the most popular things we have at our groups when we're talking about um, life enhancements, mobility and accessibility are bump-ons. Yeah. Um, yeah. And yeah. bump-ons are very, very simple. They are mm. just what they say they are just little sticky bumps yeah and for people it's like how do i get 180 on my um uh, on my oven you just stick a bump on on the 180 when yeah. you find out where it is and every time you go you just feel for the bump on it's like where's yeah. the on and off switch there and there yeah and they are it's such a simple idea and you can get the liquid the liquid ones as well now can't you where you, you can you yeah 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 yeah, yeah it's, it's in a tube and you can um Put it on appliances like your cookers because the problem with bump ons is when they get too warm they'll come off oh, so right, so yes. yeah that you can get like liquid version that's, that's in this like um uh tube like a pen and yeah. you just you just put it on as a line or whatever you want to put it on as and it's much it's, it's like much us. better for sticking to oh, things like amazing. cookers or washing machines oh, yeah. because yeah. appliances no. tend to be powder coated don't they so yeah it's not like paint essentially it's it's a different chemical makeup so yeah yeah, yeah. adhesives don't necessarily work so well it, well yeah exactly uh, uh, yeah and uh, that's the thing all this sort of equipment is like you say um if you get in touch with the rnib uh you can you can find out about a lot of these more expensive things but that's mm -hmm. where organizations like site concern local organizations come in to be quite useful because yeah. Like here, they sell bump ons, they sell a few bits and bobs of these different yeah. things. Um, you know, so um so yeah, I suppose let's talk a bit about site concern and what it what it sort of does and what what it helps people with, you know, if you can uh we'll go to Tony for this one as he's the actual uh, Sure, yeah. You know. I mean um I mean, this job I started, uh, it depends when you're watching this, doesn't it, really? But we're in, uh, I'm, I'm eight, nine months into the job now, absolutely loving it. And it's my first job working, time working for a charity. So mm -hmm. I had to learn an awful lot very quickly. Um, it really has helped that I've obviously started and I am VI. Mm -hmm. So, you know, you were talking about that empathy earlier on, Millie. Yeah. Um, I have empathy and I have lived experience yeah. and that really helps. But one thing that site concern, the first thing I noticed is that it is there's no charity quite like it for that local and that immediate contact. And right. uh, for instance, we have six what we call well-being groups. They are connections groups, and they do pretty much what it says on the team. We connect people together. Mm. So we have six of them. We have three in South Worcestershire. We've got one here where we're seeing at the moment, the Bradbury Centre in Worcester. We have one in Malvern, and we have one in Evesham. And then the three that I run are in North Worcestershire. We've got one in Redditch, one in Kidderminster, and we have one in Bromsgrove. And what happens is people come together, and it's a kind of an outreach thing. You know, people come together, and we all chat. We have the kettle on. We have bickies and we talk about an issue of that particular month, whatever it might be. We might yeah. talk about tech. We might like the last one we did, which is coming up to summer. We were talking about getting out and about and it works in two ways. The first one is that it provides information, advice and guidance to people. Right. Uh, but the other side of that is because you have a room full of people who all have a lived experience, some of it more recent, some of it all their lives, that knowledge and that hive mind, if you like, of all this, 
is wonderful to see. And, mm. and it's what's great about it is that everybody has a, a different solution. You know, every time mm. you talk about something. So whatever you're talking about, when the barrel bikes first appeared in Worcester, there was a big worry about those. What can we do? And we were involved at Site Concern. We were involved in the consultancy with that to make sure that there weren't too many obstructions, that the bike mm. bays were in the right place that kind of thing and a lot of that was down from the clients that came to the meetings so that's what i do and that's part of my job is as a community connector is to run these groups mm. uh, we have speakers occasionally as well but more importantly we have a little bit of a laugh yeah because it's not a support group as right. such it's a community well-being group yeah. and that means that yeah of course we support but when you know we're not we're not necessarily talking about recovery here. We're no. not talking about any of that. We are here to 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 give advice, yeah. but also the strength in numbers, mm. the experience of the people around the table. And yeah. some wonderful friendships are formed. And that's where that peer to peer support comes in. Peer to peer support, really important. Uh, when you get people that meet, we had one, a couple of ladies in the Evesham group last year, and they hadn't seen each other for 40 years. And they didn't know they were both coming to this meeting. Wow. And their husband, her husband gave her a lift back to her house, and now they're, you know, they're firm friends again. Oh. It's things like that, some lovely yeah. stories. So that's kind of what my job is. And then Sight Concern as a whole mm. is a charity which is all about, again, that information, advice, and guidance. So it's about making sure that you have what you need and you have the information you need to be able to empower yourself to do things. So it's not always yeah. about... With an awful lot of people, it's like people that are into social prescribing, isn't it? Mm. It's not about saying, I'll do that for you, don't no, worry. Exactly. What what it's about is about saying, this is all you have, here's a number you'll need, mm. give them a call, give us a ring back, see how you get on. Yeah, yeah. And quite a lot of people, particularly those with early sight loss, um, are in grief, they're in shock, mm. You know, they're yeah. generally scared, um, yeah. and they feel, many people I speak to, uh, meet at the groups who, who make that first step and come to a group mm. they they don't really they don't know how to feel right. they are confused and they think that their life is over they think that that's it then right. oh, i've lost my sight or i'm losing my sight i can't the first thing of course is the driving license usually yeah. they feel that that's their independence gone mm. and then they want to read and they feel they can't read and and we have this thing where we say, no, there's no such thing as can't. There's lots of things we can sort out here for you. You might not be able to drive, but you know what? Let's have a look at your disabled rail car for a start off. Let's have a look at your bus pass. Let's have a look at ways you can use taxis and community transport. So that's one way of looking at it. And all this information and guidance we can give mm. as a charity. And it's also about other events that we do. So, for instance, we... Uh, we love iPlay, which we have every Friday uh, here at the Bradbury Centre. And that's where um, children with VI or their parents with VI come along, have the best time. We have a ball pool. We have loads of toys. We all get together, have a chat with a little bit of music in the background. It's a safe space yeah. and it's wonderful. And then we have other events out and about. We have I Explore during the school holidays. Mm -hmm. We also do things like we have the Low Vision Clinic based here as well now, yeah. supported by the NHS. And we also also do all kinds of uh, employment advice um, we we give tech demonstrations and we also try as best we can on our advice lines to be able to put people in the right direction so yeah. in a sort of a big nutshell that's what we do as a charity mm. um, and it's a wonderful thing to be part of mm. because as I've said a couple of times now I Having been born VI, I had no idea that all this stuff was available to me and that so many people had a, a similar experience to me. Mm -hmm. And many people, particularly of my generation, hadn't spoken up about it at all. Mm -hmm. They just, mm -hmm. you know, the fake it till you make it kind of thing, yeah. Yeah. which is exhausting, oh, frankly. Um, so there's a couple of things that you've said in there that I want to pick up on. Mm -hmm. So the first thing, and this is just for the viewers or audience uh, listeners benefit, uh, so the first thing is you mentioned uh, about a lot of people are adjusting to, to losing their sight loss and they're yeah. going through a grief period. So I think what, um, you know, for, for both of you, you've, you've had conditions sort of since birth and obviously for Millie, yours has changed quite a lot over yeah. that time. Yeah. But um, 
you know, for the majority of people that come to site concern are probably going to be past retirement age. Yeah. Generally. Yeah. Uh, mostly the people coming through the door are uh, coming in with conditions like macular degeneration, glaucoma, um, uh, cataracts, things like that, or sometimes retinopathy, things that come uh, more commonly with old age. So, mm -hmm. you know, quite often they are coming in with uh with with quite a lot of emotions sort of all uh churned up from mm. from these big changes so that's that's one thing to mention mm. so if you are you know you've been watching this and you're all listening to this and thinking well you know these guys are talking that's great but you know i'm not great with technology i don't like that you know as tony was saying you know uh, places like this they'll find the solution that works for you not yes. not the one yeah. that works for tony yeah sort of thing or yeah. for, for me or for bill yeah. or for millie so the other thing uh which is now escaping my brain damn it while, while it's coming back actually a really important message that i'd like to put up as well and this comes out in the groups quite a lot and it's about technology mm. um we live in a world now where you can get anything online mm. And a lot of there's a lot of people out there who make a lot of money um, selling rubbish. Yes. Basically, yeah. yes. they're jumping on the bandwagon. Like these they're making. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> but the the problem is that when and you say once again, you, let's just take a let's take a fictional example. Mm. We've got somebody who is in their say early seventies, recently lost their sight. They still have quite a bit of family around them. And the family want to help. So they assume that by going online and getting that person a £3,000 magnifier yeah. and giving it to them, it's the best thing they can do for them. Mm. Um, I would say it's probably the worst thing yeah. you can do for them. Because one, that person will feel guilty that you've just spent £3,000 on them. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Two, it won't work, probably. <laughs> yeah. And so they'll feel bad about that and they'll pretend. Three, they'll, their first experience is really expensive. Well, if that £3,000 thing doesn't work, nothing will. Well, yeah. And we were going back to the bump ons again when actually, when they come to a group and we give them the bump on and we say, just try that, and all of a sudden they're back to cooking on the oven again because yeah. they know where 180 is. That's what you want. And it's, and it's those small things. And the problem with technology is that I think with a certain generation, and not just with a certain generation, with some people, mm. it's that very gentle approach to technology. And yeah. quite a lot of people who come to the groups have got an iPhone. Or they've got, a, they've, and and the first thing I saw, I point out their iPhone. I said, you know, there's a magnifier on here, and they don't. No, I just do it to make calls, and literally I just go swipe up, and there's there's the, you know, there's the the magnifier straight away. Mm. It's a free magnifier. It's already on your phone, yeah. yeah. And they're off and running, and all of a sudden the next month they'll come and say, is there anything else? Yeah. So did you know that? Yeah. Did you know that if you go into settings, go down the bottom there. You're, each you're like the cocaine going, dealer going the, yeah. gateway. <laughs> the gateway. The gateway. The great gateway app. Going uh, to the, the first one's right. free. Yeah, 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 free. Yeah, this <laughs> one's free. <laughs> Try right. now for one pound ninety nine a month. You can, but it's quite interesting, isn't it? How, you know, that one thing is like, oh, that works. So hang on, what else can we do? Mm. And and it's not being afraid of it and gently yeah, bringing absolutely. them into that world. Yeah. Um, because let's be honest, and we've said this a lot now, but technology is a it is it's so important now yeah. and it seems a shame not to not to be afraid of it mm. so just even if it's only a small thing that you can bring into the equation before you know it that they're, they're doing the whole thing the little it's, things uh, can make the biggest difference mm. yeah, exactly absolutely. and this is uh also a good segue into the other thing that i wanted to pick up on that you mentioned which is the low vision clinic so yeah um and another bit of low tech support that people often don't realize they can access it's part of the nhs as a service uh and um in many cases it's free for people to get the equipment it's uh basically for for a person who is losing their vision or has lost a certain amount of vision but still has some remaining vision they can come along and sit down with uh, an ophthalmologist who will, I think that's the right one, um, who will have a look at, uh, they do a sort of specialist um, optician's assessment, basically, and they have a look at what remaining vision you have and what magnifier will work with that. Mm. So usually a handheld magnifier, sometimes it could be on a stand, but it's your typical glass lens in a with with a handle and they work out what the right one is for you for the right thing that you're using and quite often that magnifier is provided for free mm -hmm. uh, and 
you know it's it's usually a loan basis because it's the nhs if it doesn't work for you give it back but that can really make such a difference to people even if it's only that they can read their own post where yeah. rather than and and that magnifier is like you say it's free where you see some of these companies selling these things so ridiculous and they're like three thousand yeah. pounds eight thousand pounds and they don't even flipping work in no. most mm. situations it's disgusting mm. actually yeah, yeah. there yeah. should really we're not getting too political but there should be some kind of body mm. that that has a hold on this thing because it's getting worse and you see it all the time mm. you know you see these adverts and they're misleading mm. and they're not you know they they don't work mm. um mm. They, okay they might work for some in fact it's quite funny that one of the uh, the guys the other week was talking to me about he popped into a, a supermarket somewhere and got himself a magnifier and it cost him about Four, four or five pounds and he said it's brilliant look i got it really well i said mm. fine that's great you could spend a fiver yeah. if it works for you great yeah. but don't be you know thinking that if you're spending a few grand it's going to make a difference yeah. because yeah. It, exactly. invariably it doesn't and it's a little bit like with um with certain types of glasses uh, there's mm. there's many on the market i obviously don't want to advertise too much but there there are certain ones that are really popular mm. uh, the wrap around sun and they're not really sunglasses they're they're light filtered glasses mm. and they're really effective for many of our clients and the reason that they work is because they they're the real thing mm. they're yeah. properly done yeah. whereas there are a million imitations oh, you know if you're yeah. going on a holiday there'll be people on the street selling them and yeah. telling you what they are and they so try and fool them. you with these little holograms that you can only see where you can only yeah. see the picture when you put on their glasses yeah. so it means it's it's the top tech lenses yeah, yeah. and all this yeah. kind of stuff mm. it's not they've just yeah. put a digitizer from a phone screen over the yeah. lens it does nothing <laughs> and that and that's the reason phil why i think it's important that people do have information advice yes. and guidance yeah, exactly. because it just stops that happening mm. you know so it's that stop well that can't be right no hang on uh because there isn't a fix mm. Mm. you know these these are all ways to help your lifestyle to to increase your accessibility to be able to help with mobility all these things they are there to, to enhance mm. yeah absolutely they are not a quick fix and they're not they're not a gizmo they're not a no, gadget exactly. they're a proper tool exactly. that needs yeah. to be used right so yeah cool uh so uh millie we want to come back to you finally uh on this uh so because you volunteer down here at site concern i do yeah uh and so uh, i mean by the sounds of it you volunteer and do all sorts of things all over the place so what what sort of thing have they got you doing down here because i've seen you around the building doing various things at different times and i managed to get uh, i was like oh i need someone for the podcast and I said, oh, i'll speak to millie millie will do it. <laughs> <laughs> you don't walk past the door you get dragged in don't you? <laughs> um i do all sorts of things kind of jack of all trade kind of <laughs> um uh, i help them with um information and guidance when it comes to um, health and fitness right um clubs that they may not be aware of uh, mm. sports clubs they may not be aware of um as i'm a volunteer for rnib uh with their sea sport differently campaign we linked up there as well and um we set up an event uh with the uh sea sport different guys and the british blind sport guys mm. um which was a really good event it went went down really well and it was um to uh discuss different uh vi sports um have a have a bit of a go um with some different sports uh mm. like vi tennis right. had a bit of a go with uh goal ball had a feel of of the balls and the different equipment mm -hmm. um and we just discussed what was what was around um the local area um clubs that were you know that may be useful mm -hmm. and yeah that was a great session um i also help with um sort of any kind of tech that they want checked out um so a couple of weeks ago i was going through the different radios and alarm clocks kind of just to uh check their function mm -hmm. make sure they all worked okay um but i, I, I do all sorts of uh, even from stuffing envelopes <laughs> yeah right, right. yeah yeah so I, 
whatever they want me doing are doing. Um, also have um been on walks with um local councillors um to discuss the um kind of accessibility of Worcester Good, okay. um and uh kind of the, the, the pavement clutter mm, yeah. um you know how, how we can make life a little bit easier um yeah, shop boards outside shops yes a bit like yeah mm. yeah, yeah. Boards. um yeah so I, I do a lot of different things um yeah, yeah brilliant amazing and i mean that's the thing i think with any organization like this um you know it survives on the volunteer support at the end oh, of the day definitely, you know yeah one of the things that we haven't really touched on is the different types of voluntary support there are available for people here so mm-hmm. you you know you've mentioned some things there that i didn't even know they were doing uh, but equally, there's um, befriending that goes on, yeah. you know, there's support for, you know, like these groups and things that Tony does or yeah. that I play, yeah. you know, quite a few volunteers will come along and support with things like that. And again, just even some of the stuff like stuffing envelopes, mm-hmm. you know, to, to mail out to what I think, you know, I think there's around about 2000 people uh, who who. Uh, are signed up to site concern you know that's a lot of envelopes to stuff yeah, yeah. and it wasn't yeah. it wasn't all on many i have to say you know there was yeah, there was a there fair was few of us doing it yeah there was a fair few coming in each giving up two or three hours here or there just sitting there and cup of tea headphones on bash 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 and and just getting those out so stuff like that that really makes the difference yeah. and i think as well you know we were mentioning earlier a bit about um you know, uh, people getting involved and doing things and and getting over agoraphobia or mm. fears about stuff. You know, you could you could go to your local sight loss organisation or or similar organisation, see what volunteering things that they've got going on. It might just yeah. be you do a couple of hours a week stuff in envelopes. You don't have to talk to anyone. You just sat in uh, a room on your own, and it just helps get you out the house and gets you over that. That good for the soul yeah, good for the soul. Yeah. good for the soul i think one of the things about volunteers in the groups uh, as well when we do talk about the connections groups is that when we're looking at volunteers who you say are absolutely essential and no charity can survive exactly. without the volunteers and they do a brilliant job and one of the things that is essential for the group's point of view is that when we run a group for instance it's not just about making the teas and the coffees mm. It's about, say, a new client comes into the group the very first time they've arrived. They're nervous. They're not quite sure. Ha- you can just sit and chat to that person and make them feel welcome. Yeah. You know, um, that's an es- essential part of what we do. Mm. And also being part of that group. And you make the most incredible friendships. And we have, as you said before, Stuart, about the demographic, you know, quite a lot of people are over the age of 70. And they have the most incredible stories. They have lived a life and then some. Mm. And to be, it's a real honor to be around those people. But of course, that the, the, the busyness of the room and the fact mm. that there's a lot of people to talk to, some people, sometimes people can miss out. And that's Indeed. where volunteers come in because they can chat as well. And it's a, it's a proper, it, there's a lot of camaraderie in the room. There's mm. a lot, there's an yeah. awful lot of goodwill. And yeah, it's a very like, positive thing. Like last year when we did the um, Winter <laughs> Carnival. Yeah, right. uh, we did the Bright for Sight. Uh, our our float was a walking float, um, called it Bright for Sight. But we had um, all sorts of different members. We had the the members um, from the I Play, uh, so the parents and their kids. There was uh, there were um, people from the different groups. Um, there were guide, you know, people guides. There were the staff. Mm. So everybody worked together. So it's it's like a little community. Yeah, it's lovely, um, isn't it? Yeah. It's really, yeah. really nice. Yeah, yeah that's what you need. Yeah. I suppose because certainly the the psychological impact, like you were saying before, when the people are confused and scared and stuff like that, it's good to have communities like that available for them that aren't necessarily like focused and too obvious about being the come on we're here to support you and make you better let's come on yeah, come yeah. on yeah you yeah. know just yeah, like yeah. oh come on let's hang out is hang much yeah, better yeah. isn't it? There's, yeah. a, there's a pressure off, and I mm. think also it may be worth mentioning that for many people um whether it's sight loss or whatever it might be if something's mm. on you something's troubling you yeah you're having a hard time in life 
it's sometimes it, it's just not right. You don't you just don't want to burden your family mm. with it. Yeah. Especially those that feel, oh, my family are doing so much for me. Mm. This, you know, we are like family. Yeah. But we're not family. Yeah. So therefore, they can come to us and feel mm. comfortable in the way they would with their own family. Yeah. But then they can go back to their family mm. and they exactly. any things they're worried about, they might want to share with them. They can share it with us if they want to, if they feel comfortable doing that. Yeah. yeah. Um, or, or with a, a new friend that they find within the group. Mm. And again, that is helped a lot by volunteers because mm. the volunteers are helping make their, the people feel more comfortable Indeed. and feel like a family. Yeah. So that's that's a that's a weight off in many respects, isn't it? Because you yeah. don't always want to tell your family and your friends how you feel. Because you don't no. want to feel like you're whinging all the time. No, exactly. You know? It's nice to have a little bit of distance, isn't it? Mm. People like you can, you know, the important part of it all is like leaving, not to be yeah. you know, like rude, but being yeah. able to sort of walk away and say, right, okay, I can I can separate that off over yeah. there for a moment and mm. go oh. back to my family, clean slate, yeah, and I open. I was going to say as well, like sometimes family can be a bit too close. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's better mm. to get that kind of support from other people. Yeah, um, and and get it from somebody else's pers perspective as well. Yeah, yeah. so A like, like, slightly you... less biased p perspective, I suppose. Mm. Yeah, right. yeah I've, I hear it said quite a lot when people say, "Oh, they don't want to hear me whinging on," mm. and um, and it's funny because if that's how they feel. Mm then that's that's actually quite sad yeah because they feel they're whinging a lot which was yeah. there to me for they're probably not no, they're exactly. bottling it up they yeah. feel yeah. they're following it because they're, and they're not whinging yeah. so if they want to come and have a whinge they come to us and have a whinge yeah. and actually half of the time when they're whinging we start laughing yeah, yeah. because yeah. there's always and it, it, this is the oldest of the old but yeah. there's always somebody worse off than you yeah, in yeah. any room yeah. there's always somebody who's got a you know you're, you're sorry there's there's always somebody in your room who will have something that's going to knock your socks off yeah, yeah, yeah. what am i what am i moaning about today yeah oh. yeah, yeah well, no. so and that's a real leveler yeah. <laughs> you know many times definitely yeah. no i think um yeah we probably need to sort of bring things to a close now and that's a, sure. a nice point to to kind of end on um it's been absolutely fantastic having you join us and giving up your time to yeah. talk to us today okay. thank and, you for inviting um, yeah thanks for inviting us yeah. what I'd, um, oh, thank you for coming i enjoyed like, it too yeah <laughs> sorry <laughs> you okay i am i'm starting to have an asthma attack but we'll be all right uh what i'd just there. like to am i on camera at yes. the moment? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah so what i'd just like to say to uh viewers and listeners obviously if you're watching this on youtube uh please do share your experiences in the comments as well if you've had experience of sight loss uh either you have it yourself or you're supporting somebody with that um there will be information and such in the description we'll have links to different websites we'll have links to the rnib and things like that because obviously you might not be in worcestershire but there will be a link to site concern as well if you are in in worcestershire um but yeah if you need support or any information or anything like that pop that in the the comments and we'll try and get that to you and um and just let us know your experiences and things as well and mm -hmm. chat amongst yourselves too sometimes that's nice I tend to find in some of the comment sections on Probably my channel, people other. will support each yeah. other. And that's one of the, the good things there. So, yeah. So, yeah. Uh, just once again, finally, thank you yeah. guys for coming and joining us. Thank you. Sir. Cheers. Indeed, it's been fun. Cheers, you. Cheers, Okay. Thank Take you. care. Bye. Thank Bye, you. all.